The Bane Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, rampaging mass markets kick up a storm of savings. Large arrays of self-aware supercomputers team together to invent an artificially intelligent naval and then disappear into it neatly solving the singularity threat. Well, as we continue the complete audiobook serialization of David Weber's uncompromising honor, all right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain Senior Editor Tony Daniel. We continue with the conclusion of a two-part interview with Larry Correa this time. Larry discusses his new high fantasy novel, Destroyer of Worlds. This is the third book in the saga of the Forgotten Warrior series, and it's a, it's a stem winder. It's really good. It's an adventure, confrontation, revelation, like you've never seen before in the series. It's an excellent novel. And we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of David Weber's Honor Harrington series masterpiece, Uncompromising Honor. Now here's the news. The Misty Magic September ebook sale continues through the month. Save $2 per ebook on four titles and $1 on ebooks on everything else that Mercedes Lackey has written for Bain. $2 off on Silence by Mercedes Lackey and Cody Martin. $2 off on Breaking Silence by Mercedes Lackey and Cody Martin. $2 off on The Waters in the Wild by Mercedes Lackey and Rosemary Edgehill. And $2 off on The Wizard of Carries by Mercedes Lackey, Eric Flint, and Dave Freer. Plus $1 off on all other Mercedes Lackey's ebooks, all of them. Sale continues to the stroke of midnight, October 1st. So take advantage of these great savings now. Hey, those rampaging band September mass markets are stampeding into the homes of lucky readers everywhere. Giddy up. First, there's The Waters in the Wild by Mercedes Lackey and Rosemary Edgehill, which in addition to being out in mass market is now $2 off the already lowered ebook price. This is a huge ebook bargain at $4.99. When Olivia accepts swimming star Blake's invitation to the Adirondack resort camp of Lake Endor, it quickly becomes clear that all is not as it seems at the 100-year-old resort. Not only is Blake not the guy she thought he was, there's something far more sinister afoot. There's something lying beneath the waters of Lake Endor, something not of this world. Also out in mass market in September is Straight Out of Deadwood by David Boop. Saddle up and venture to the wild frontier town of Deadwood and its creepy environs. The West that once was rides again, but this time with the West that could have been, chasing after like a spitting hell cat on its tail. Stories by Charlene Harris, Mike Resnick, and a lot more great writers. And finally out in mass market now is Stellaris, People of the Stars, edited by Les Johnson and Robert E. Hampson. In order to reach the stars, humanity may have to undergo fundamental transformation. We may find that Homo sapiens is on its way to becoming a new and unique species, Homo Stellaris, the People of the Stars. These original science fiction stories and accessible Pieces by top scientists will take you to that future. Stellaris, People of the Stars, edited by Les Johnson and Robert E. Hampson, straight out of Deadwood, edited by David Boop, and The Waters in the Wild by Mercedes Lackey and Rosemary Edgehill are now available in mass market at booksellers everywhere, which also means the ebook prices drop too. So round them up, partner, for some great reading. This is part two of a two-part interview with Larry Correa discussing Destroyer of Worlds. Part one is available on last week's podcast. Hey, I want to welcome Larry Correa back to the podcast. Hey, Larry. Hey, guys. 
Uh, Larry Correa is the creator of the Wall Street Journal and New York Times best-selling Monster Hunter series with first entry Monster Hunter International, as well as the urban fantasy hardbold adventure saga, The Grim Noir Chronicles, one of my favorites. The first entry is Hard Magic and his epic fantasy series, which we'll be talking about, The Saga of the Forgotten Warrior, includes first entry Son of the Black Sword, House of Assassins, and uh, the latest entry is Destroyer, Destroyer of Worlds. Uh, Larry's an avid gun user and advocate who's shot on a competitive level for many years. Uh, before becoming a full-time writer, he was an accountant. Um, I can't believe you gave that up for, for, for writing, but uh, you know, a lot of writers spend their lives just trying to make it as an accountant, but, and you had well, it. Accounting is fun, it. to be fair. I, 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 I actually enjoyed that. That was a fun job. Yeah. So uh, Larry lives in Utah with his wife and family. Now you tell me, I understand you're in your writing room right now, since we're on video, um, you know, we're doing these, uh, one is video and one is audio now. Um, could you show the video users your uh, secret sure. inner sanctum of, of monster hunter -dom? Sure thing. Um, this is my office. This is my writing desk right here where I work. Uh, I have kind of the back corner of this room. That's my painting area over there. But just to give you guys an idea, uh, this is my office, that's my video game area, it's my war gaming tables. Uh, I got about 30 feet of minis. It's kind of a mess right now because I was changing some stuff. But uh, yeah, I've got a pretty good size office, about 1,100 square feet <laughs> of, of Larry's, Larry's party room. <laughs> now, you used to like write in the little like dank closet in the basement when you first started. Yeah. Right? Yeah, actually, uh, so I wrote my first book, uh, and it was the basement of our little tiny house, and we had, uh, it was concrete, it was, un it was an unfinished room, my desk was an old door on top of cinder blocks, uh, in the winter I would actually write with gloves and a hat on, because <laughs> it was so cold, and uh, yeah, but it was, yeah. Uh, I did that for, I did that for a few years, and uh then moved to a different house where I actually had my own little writing area, which was kind of cool. And then when we built this house, I went completely crazy. <laughs> it looks like you're up in the attic, sort of. I am, yeah. So I've got a four-car garage. And so this is the room uh, on top of the whole garage, basically, is my office. So it's pretty sweet. I got really cool views. Uh, let's see. Got really cool mountain views all the way around, which is kind of neat. And, oh, that's uh, beautiful. You guys, a little bit of an idea here. So that's kind of fun. Well, let's talk a little bit about maybe the first fight, um, since uh, the first big war thing that happened, which is isn't it the fight at uh, Dakantar? Oh. Uh, that the, the this is Ashok's first like really going into battle kind of thing with with yeah big now that was fun because I had to do a lot of research because my background uh, I read a lot of action scenes but my background is guns I mean that's my real life background I was a firearms instructor for years I came from the gun business so when I started out writing like Monster Hunter which is an urban fantasy uh, writing those action scenes is a piece of cake because that's my background that's the stuff I know I'm, I'm trained on that stuff I've, I've learned about it my whole life. And whenever I had to ask people about any sort of particular real life thing, I know a lot of people who actually have done that kind of thing. So the action scenes in Monster Hunter, piece of cake. Well, I get into this. This is swords, horses, bows, <laughs> cavalry maneuvers. Not my area of expertise. And so I had to start doing research uh, into this. Uh, I, I recommend Hank Reinhardt's Book of the Sword by Bayon to yeah, anybody who's yeah. writing fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely a good book. Uh, Tony Weisskopf hooked me up with some different people uh, to have helped me um, and proofread the, the the action scenes of this. But I'm actually really proud of these. But so the the Battle of Dakantar, what that is is uh, as Ashok and Thera and all the people come out of the swamps where they've been wintering, they're crossing the plains and they come across all these massacres where the warrior caste has been sent in just to kill the castless. And this part of the country is uh, that they move into is kind of like uh, the uh, high plains is what they're is they're, what they're walking up into heading towards the mountains, a very open grassy area. The people live nomadically. There's a lot they they live in what's called the gray homes. They're basically felt yurts is what people live in. 
Uh, they're finding all these massacres. Well, there's this one mining town uh, nearby. It has a huge castless population, and they, they're told that the warriors are going there. Um, so actually, they intercept a smaller group of warriors, basically a platoon uh, of warriors, and they ambush them in the night. They kill them all, or almost all of them. Um, so they run so on the way to this town. So they decide, you know, okay, we're going to take the banner of this group that we just whacked, and we're coming in from this other angle. This, these other four platoons are on the other side of the valley, assembling to ride down in this town and slaughter hundreds of castles. But they're this waiting is for the our great rights. extermination beginning. Yeah, this is the experiment for the. They're doing it in this one region, and so I have several platoons over, around the valley, and this one newcomer arrives. But it's not the newcomer; it's actually Ashok and his guys, and they come riding up. Half of, half of them have never ridden horses before, which is great. <laughs> and they're like, well, then we're not going to cavalry maneuver against, you know, four groups. So their plan is we're going to rush into the town. They're going to think from across the valley that we are the fourth platoon that they've been waiting for, only we're jumping the gun and we're going to go kill all the castles and gain all the glory. So they're thinking as warriors, you know. And so when they rush in, the other groups are not ready. And they're like, oh, crap, these young upstarts are going to, like, steal all our honor. This is not the order. We better rush in there and kill all the. Let's go kill all these guys too before they kill them all. <laughs> so they basically rush into complete pandemonium. It's kind uh, of a way of getting process. the element of surprise down. when you can't possibly get the element of surprise. Yeah, exactly. So there was like, so they basically just forced everyone else to jump the gun. They're not expecting actual enemy a, 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 a group of enemy combatants to ride into this. They're expecting non people who aren't allowed to hone weapons. Uh, they have no warrior tradition. They have no training. Everything they've seen so far has been, there's been handfuls of pockets of actual rebels, but most of these guys are just scrubs who they've been steamrolling. So all of a sudden, hundreds of these warriors are like, whoa, whoa, our, our brethren from this other town are coming here to steal our honor. Uh -huh. So they rush into the shanty town only instead of slaughtering castles, they run into Ashok and Vidal and a whole bunch of really ruthless killers. <laughs> <laughs> it's just violent as sin as they're out there fighting in the mud and, and between the tents and the and the shacks and the Nashok rides out to just basically decapitate their leadership by himself because he can do that. Um, great little sequence in there where Ashok throws down with the bodyguard uh, of, of the general uh, and that that one particular bodyguard is interesting. That guy's gonna. That guy has a pivotal part to play. We might so, see him. Again. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Won't say too much because that's all in this uh, book. But yes, that guy yeah. actually plays a part. So, um, all right. Uh, one other thing we can't say much about, but that is uh, that's a big deal in the book is this uh, is there's a new sort of magic that starts to show up. It's called fortress <laughs> magic, and it might not even be really magic because it it kind of might be something we already know about. Um, <laughs> I don't yeah, know what okay, we... so throughout the series i've made references to this and we've seen it and it actually makes one occur so basically to anybody who's a modern reader we're going to read it and recognize that this is gunpowder it's chemistry um except to the inquisition and to the law it's what's called fortress magic and the reason they call it fortress is there's an island because remember the ocean is hell man doesn't cross the ocean However, there's one island due south of Locke, and Locke is in the southern hemisphere, so the further south you go, the colder it gets. There's this island just off the coast, so it's visible, but you still can't get there because, you know, you still have to cross a demon-infested water to get there, but there are people on this island. And uh, the people of Locke have not dealt with these people for hundreds of years. However, what they do know of them is they're what they call religious fanatics and that they still believe in the old, old ways. And every now and then, somehow, we don't know how, these people smuggle their magic over to the mainland to cause trouble. And they give it to the rebels, and the rebels screw with people. And basically what it is is, is grenades and guns. Um, and when I say guns, I mean, we're talking uh, uh, matchlocks. So we're not talking high tech. And the grenades are basically uh, pots filled with powder with a rag stuck in them, set on fire and hucked in the general direction of who you want to blow up. So not real high tech, but that's fortress magic. But as uh, the series goes on, we've seen that more and more of this somehow is getting introduced to the rebels. More, the castles are winding up with greater numbers of these, and the warrior caste hates it. These guys have trained their whole lives to fight by sword and bow and horse, and you go out in the field and get your head blown off by some dude who, some castless fish eater yeah. who's never... Totally unfair. 
it's, it's not right. You're supposed it's, to be able to kill them. <laughs> um, and so what happens is uh, we do get into this book where that's coming from a little bit and also uh, what's actually happening there. And, um, and, and who is, who is bringing this stuff amongst the people. And I don't want to give too much away because that's a, that's some reveals in destroyer of worlds. Um, and actually this stuff pays like, this stuff really changes the world because you can't really push around untouchable non people if, uh, <laughs> if they have guns. <laughs> so yeah, it, um, so yeah, so I set out to write an epic fantasy and it's still got guns in it, you know? <laughs> Well, <laughs> at least you held off for, for... Yeah. Oh, no, no. But they, they, oh. And actually, they do, actually, there is a scene in this one, uh, I can't say where, where something extremely pivotal involving one of these happens politically. Uh, and when I say politically, it, like, change the world uh, kind of thing. And because uh, uh, I've set this up about the series with the first cast where... Omond has kind of been pulling their strings and kind of guiding them by the nose to think the way he wants them to think. I did little things like in the last book, there's a scene where Omond is actually putting on plays. He's taking real life events that we've seen in the books involving Ashok. And then we're seeing the play, which is Omond's twisted version of events to, uh, to like propagandize what, what, what he wants the people to think. Um, yeah. It's almost so like an evil Hollywood, uh, Oh yeah, in the, he, <laughs> I, I took my lesson from current events. There, you can just make people think what you want if you control TV. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so no, Amand is Amand is a master. Uh, he's he's a puppeteer with his people, and uh, it's great because he's got to 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 him. He's got Ashok in the form of Ashok. He's got this perfect villain, this scared because he was he was a he was a castless who impersonated his way into the highest caste that everybody thought was this perfect servant of the law who then betrayed them. And now he's a super powered murder machine who's out there killing members of the first cast, uh, on behalf Very of Very useful Catholics. for Oman. Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's fantastic. Uh, there are know. other power and you, we start to see them. There, there's other power centers here like Harta, um, oh, who's a really Harta. cool character. Um, and he, I he, like Harta. he interacts with Rada, um, in the book so yeah okay so Harta, Harta. Um, Harta Badal is the he's the leader he's the he's the, he's the um he is the what's called Thakur uh, Thakur is the the head of a house he's that's the boss of a great house uh and so he is the guy in charge of great house Vidal, uh which is the richest uh it's 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 the economic powerhouse of all the houses in Vidal, and it's in the north which is bounteous and rich and uh that's where Ashok, Ashok comes, comes from. from, right? But when Harta was a kid, the first time we see Harta is in the first book, and it's flashback twenty years ago, when he was basically a teenager, and uh, his mom was the Fekor. and uh, even then, Harta was kind of a weaselly little politician. And uh, so when Ashok, uh, when they, when Ash the castless boy picks up the sword, they basically send him off to a wizard to erase his memory. Harta was part of that um, conspiracy. That's the first time we meet him. Well, then now, 20 years later, uh, we get to deal with this guy again. And what turns out, he is a supremely good orator. Uh, he is a master politician. He is a weasel amongst weasels. And he is in it to win it for his house. Uh, so we run into Harta again. And he is he's not a pushover, though. Like, like when you, when you met him in the first book, he was a kid. Uh, he was kind of an idiot. <laughs> there's a, there's a scene with a little castle boy with Ashok where he goes up and he touches Ashok's head. And he's looking for something. And his mom is like, what are you doing? He's like, I'm looking for horns. Castles have horns. And she's like, no, you idiot. They're physically the same as us. And he's like, Oh, <laughs> just cause you know, that's how we had been raised. Yeah. Um, cause they were so far above that these people are like pigs to him. And, um, no, but we get into, we get into Harta a little bit. And Harta has actually got his contingent of bodyguards. Uh, there's a couple of really cool guys in there that wind up helping Rada. Uh, excellent, uh, excellent scene involving some, uh, Inquisitor assassins, uh, making a move on Great House of the Doll. 
Uh, that was really yeah. pleased with. Well, he's. Kaiser. I mean, so he's awesome. capable of giving some friction to Oman, and he's he's not cowed by Oman, which is right. Cool. See, wait, so Oman is such a master games player that that as the series goes on, you, you see, he really is super good at like like finding who his potential adversaries are and then looking for ways to eliminate them. And in Harta, he's got kind of a traditional uh, uh, lock politician. And uh, Harta, I don't think, realizes the level of evil that is that Omond actually is. Um, but he is, however, one of the things standing in the way. And the biggest reason uh, Harta is against the castless genocide, not that he gives a crap about the um, castless, it's that economically it's not good for Vidal because they need the labor because of the rivers. And her, uh, Oman really wants it, so Harta doesn't want to let him have it. <laughs> That's really what it is. Yeah. He's like, he's this gonna, guy I really don't like really wants this, so I'm going to stand in his way. Yeah. He's so. a great slimy character, and uh, I'm sure we'll see even more of him. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. And there's oh, one and other character. He Go ahead. works for this guy. <laughs> And uh, Jack Deesh is also from there, right? So he has to come yeah. back and deal with the, him too. So he's a yeah. big part of the book. Um, yeah, Jake, that's basically he, uh, the core is the supreme commander of the, uh, of all the armies. Uh, so, the, so the entire warrior caste answers to him. Uh, even though Hart is a politician, he's not a warrior. Doesn't matter. He's still their authority. Uh, and so he's Jack Deesh's boss. Uh, and he's so slimy because there's a part where Jagdish is in a lot of trouble. I can't really say too much, but basically Hart is kind of stuck and he's like, well, I really want to kill this guy. <laughs> I really want to murder him. But if I murder him, that'll make me look bad. Yeah. Hmm. Well, that's, the, that's the thing about Hart that's cool though, is that he's, he's got internal principles. They're just utterly uh, like, it, it's about making sure that Vidal uh, yeah. gains more power. And so in his way, he is actually a really good leader for his people because it's all, he, he, he's in it for his house to win it. Right. And so that's, so in a way he's actually yeah. a good leader. He's a complete slime bag, but he's an I army slime bag. I shouldn't go there, but he sort of wants to make Vidal great, great again. Bad <laughs> 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 <Vaga>. guy. <laughs> But no, Hart is, Hart is, Hart is, yeah. is, is sharp. So like the part with that, I always really love that scene with Jagdish because he's like, on a personal level, I want to kill you because if I, because Ashok Badal likes you and if I, and I kill one of Ashok's friends, that'll upset Ashok and that alone is worth it to me. However, if I kill you, the warrior cast will be really sad and I need them to go to war soon and I can't have them with low morale. So, like, crap, what am I going to do? <laughs> it's a conundrum. Well, I mean, what's cool, though, is also is Jagdish, while he is a man of great honor, is also well aware of, of what a slimy guy's boss is and is quite willing to use his honor um, as long as he stays within. He's got his path, and Jagdish has his, and they both are finding some way to, to make. Anyway, it's a great scene. Um, what about, uh, there's one other character we've seen, and, and we see her more here, and she's just starting to show up, Mother Dawn. Um, oh, okay. People have been asking about who, who is she for three books now, and I'm slowly, that's a slow reveal. Um, so basically, we have this mysterious woman who shows up in the first book, um, and, and she shows up, and, and when you first meet her, she's an old castless woman, and she shows up, and she gives Ashok some really cryptic but helpful advice. Okay, that's when we see her in this first book. In the second book, um, the Sons of the Black Sword are basically these apostate warriors. They're, they're warriors that actually do believe in religion, who have been joining up with rebels, um, and Ashok's their leader. But as they're gathering more of these guys, they're like, well, how did you know to come here? How did you know to find us? And they're like, well, Mother Dawn told us. Only to some of these guys, Mother Dawn is a 40-year-old worker caste woman. And to somebody else, she's a 25-year-old warrior cast woman. And also, they're talking, the way they're talking is like, well, she is, she's at one side of the continent at the same time as she was at the other side of the continent, telling these guys where to go and how to get there. And so we've run into this woman repeatedly who apparently can see the future 
and manipulate events. Uh, and then when we see her, we do see her again in the third book. Um, and now this time she's a first cast woman uh, and she gives Gutch a job. So don't want to give there, too much there away you go. there. Yeah. yeah. One other character that's fascinating to me that we should, maybe we could talk about a little bit before we, uh, <clears throat> we pretty much exhausted what we can say without giving anything else. It's so hard when you're in a third book. <laughs> uh, Ratul is, is, he's Aww. dead now, but he sort of set everything in motion and he was involved with both Thera and, uh, Ashok, yeah. our two main characters. Um, Ratul, Ratul, um, okay, so Ratul, and in fact, there's a short story, uh, called The Testimony of the Traitor Ratul, which is available on the band website for free, and it's also in my Target Rich Environment short story collection. Um, and it's Ratul's backstory. It's just a journal entry from Ratul explaining his life. Now, Ratul is this really interesting character because when we see him originally from Ash, young Ashok's perspective, he's this brutal, hard-nosed head of the Protector Order. Very law and order, ruthless, ruthless teacher, um, just, a, just a brutal instructor. And that's how we first meet him. And then when we move to present times, he's always referred to as the traitor Ratul. And what, what Devados says about him is that he wandered off, became a religious fanatic, uh, started believing in the old ways, and then disappeared. But then when we see from Thera's backstory, we see uh, Ratul, how Ratul discovered religion <laughs> was because uh, as a protector, he was out there putting down a rebellion, and he came across Thera, uh, who at the time was a prisoner, because uh, her family had rebelled and it had failed. And... Uh, that's when her power, um, uh, her power of prophecy manifests, and Ratul sees it. And she's and the prophet of the forgotten one. We should that, yeah, that's, that's of, the, the of the forgotten gods of the of the of the banned illegal religion. Mm. Well, because then Ratul saves her life, and it turns out that Ratul has been a believer um, for generation uh, in secret. And so when she appeared, uh, he stepped up and saved her, and then whisked her away and hit her the big secret hideout that the rebellion is using is actually a thing that ratul found uh dozens of years before um uh, and never told anyone about because he knew that someday it would be valuable to the gods uh for the gods plans and, and so he's the guy that trained really ashok and davidas our two yeah. uh, mega warriors so um, yeah, ratul possibly the best swordsman of modern times uh, and he was so he was and he was the, the guy who trained the two main characters, which is interesting when they're fighting because they have to keep switching out of stuff that Ratul taught them because <laughs> the other guy wouldn't see it coming. Um, Ratul's really interesting too because, like I said, this is a this is a, where religion has been banned, um, you know. But but there's little hints as to what the religions were before in the different houses. Uh, Ratul is from a place called Sarnabat which uh, the wolf is what they call them amongst the people. Uh, they're, they're kind of a violent uh, people. But it's interesting, we're getting little clues to the, the Ratul's uh, backstory. It was fascinating. I love writing that short story. He was a sensitive guy. He actually, as a kid, he was a dancer. He didn't want to be a fighter. <laughs> he got sent off to do this. Uh, and he turned out that dancing was really similar to sword fighting. <laughs> And uh -huh. Ratul actually was a sensitive young man who turned into like this uh -huh. lethal, brutal, hardened killer. <laughs> he and, could be uh, in the Bollywood version. <laughs> I love Ratul, yeah. And he oh, yeah. was a little, little angry man. And it was interesting because as the series goes on, we discovered that for 20 years, Ratul has been laying the groundwork of this rebellion while he was uh, the Lord Protector. So it was basically like having the chief law enforcement officer in the country. It was like the head of the FBI secretly works for the mafia. <laughs> and Ratul is just laying groundwork this whole time. And uh, that's all coming to pay off. Yeah. And, and this uh, book is the coming, I mean, this, it's this, the inevitable coming together of Ashok and, and Davidas, his two greatest disciples. That's, and it's an amazing scene when they, when they do. And uh, I mean, that's, it, it's just worth it for that alone. Um, what are the best what, fights you've done ever I, I think I do, I do think that's one of the best fight scenes I've ever written was the was the standoff between those two guys. That was pretty brutal. Um, and that was yeah, I can't give away too much of obviously third book. Uh, now okay, so originally just a little bit about that. So when I first pitched this series to Tony Weisskopf, um, I said, This is what I have in mind, and I, I pitched to her as a trilogy, as a three book deal. 
And I wrote Son of the Black Sword. She loved it. She took it. Uh, and then she's like, okay, so what else do you have planned for the rest of the trilogy? And I told her. And I was like, I want to do this, 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 and this. And I walked through this thing. And Tony looked at that and she goes, you will never fit that into three books. She's like, that will not fit in three books. I guarantee it. She's like, that's at least five. And I was like, oh, I can fit it into three. Then I started writing House of Assassins. And the entire book of House of Assassins is basically half of what I thought the second book was going to be in my original outline. So I was like, yep, yeah, Tony's right. Uh, and then, uh, so this is more, this is probably going to be about a five or six book series instead of a three book series. Uh, so originally the plan was three book series, but that just did not shake out. Uh, by the time I got the second book done, I was like, oh no, I'm not going to, <laughs> I'm not going to hit that. <laughs> but I do have the overall arc since the beginning. And so uh, I'm really excited about it. It's, it's a lot of fun. There's some big reveals coming and it just flips the whole world on its head. So I, it well, should what, be pretty cool. What else are you working on at the moment? Oh, uh, actually, today uh, I'm doing the final, final edits. Uh, I got the edits back from Tony Weisskopf for uh, a book called Gun Runners that comes out in February. And that right, is yeah. uh, in John Brown, uh, John D. Brown. Uh, it's a collaboration. It's a science fiction novel. It's an action adventure sci fi novel. Um, we came up with this idea years ago. We were doing a panel together. It was one of those panels where the audience gives you ideas and you outline a whole novel on the fly. Uh, only we did this at LTUE and outlined this whole novel on the fly and got done and said, wow, this is actually pretty good. We want to make this into a real book. And so here we are a few years later. We got the chance to finally do that. Um, so that will be out in February. Uh, I just have to change a few things around and uh, final edits and that'll be done. So, and, that and one then after have that, have guns. Well, gonna, <laughs> I'm working on the next Monster Hunter novel too. So the next cool. Monster Hunter is called Monster Hunter Bloodlines. And it comes out the second half of 2021. I don't know the actual date. Uh, I don't want to say we're like August or September, I think. Um, but I'm working on that now. And I still, got a, I still got a ways to go on it. So Very cool. Very cool. So, well, the book at, at Booksellers now is um, Destroyer of Worlds by Larry Correa. And it is a big... Uh, it, it, it's a novel within itself that, um, for this, and it's really got a great, um, climax that just is a, a series high and, and, um, a, a novel high is definitely something to go out and get. Oh, okay. One real quick thing though, I just got to throw out because I found out about this the other day. Normally the on audible, the audio book drops the same day as the physical book. However, there's been a production delay of some kind. Um, so the audio book will not be ready on September 1st. And so it'll be sometime after that. It, there is an audio book coming. I don't know the date of that yet, though. So, yeah, yeah. yeah that, well, that uh, I'm sure they're experiencing uh, uh, flu-related delays. And yeah, everybody so, yeah. in the world is having delays right now, so this is not that weird. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, well, very cool. So it's Destroyer of Worlds, and uh, Larry, thanks so much for talking with us about it. Oh, my pleasure. Anytime. That was part two of a two-part interview with Larry Correa discussing Destroyer of Worlds. Part one is available on last week's podcast. Here is another entry in David Weber's Honor Harrington series masterpiece, Uncompromising Honor. Honor keeps her promise. The Solarian League. For hundreds of years, they have borne the banner of human civilization. But the bureaucratic mandarins who rule today's league are corrupt and looking for scapegoats. They've decided the upstart star kingdom of Manticore must be annihilated. Uncompromising courage. Honor Harrington has won the star kingdom's uniform for half a century. Very few know war the way Honor Harrington does. So far, hers has been a voice of caution. But now the Mandarins have committed atrocities such as the galaxy has not known in a thousand years. They have finally killed too many of the people Honor Harrington loves. Uncompromising vengeance. Now Honor Harrington is coming for the Solarian League, and hell is riding in her wake. And now, David Weber's Uncompromising Honor. Ajay Terminus. Prime Ajay Hyperbridge. 
So you still liking the odds Giselle gave you, Andy? Commander Aloka Menendez inquired, turning her command chair to face Andreas Bezignos, her executive officer. Lieutenant Bezignos looked back without saying a word, and Sarah Chi, HMS Boomslang's tactical officer, chuckled without taking her attention from her own displays. Should have known better, Andy, she told him. First, because the Commodore, well, he's the Commodore. When was the last time you saw him get it wrong? Whenever it was, I'm pretty sure it was the first time, too. But even leaving that aside, nobody in his right mind bets against Giselle. And even if they did, nobody'd be, I hate to say it, but dumb is the only word that comes to mind. To do it when she offers odds, what were you thinking? Bezignos maintained his dignified silence, but his lips twitched. She had a point. At 40 T years, Lieutenant Giselle Parkinen, Fire Snake's executive officer, was the old woman of the group, 17 months older than Commander Menendez. Her relatively ancient age for her rank had nothing to do with lack of competence. She'd just been busy doing other things until the People's Republic of Haven's Operation Thunderbolt brought her a direct commission from the Merchant Service. If she didn't end up with an Admiral Stars, it would only be because somebody managed to kill her along the way. And as his good friend Chi had just so kindly pointed out, Parkinen never had the wrong end of the odds in a friendly wager. She also had a nasty and expensive knack for filling inside straits. For that matter, she was one of the best TOs he'd ever met, and her analysis of Plan Estacada, and what the hell was an Estacada anyway, had been spot on so far. He didn't see much chance that was going to change anytime soon, and he wondered what he'd been sniffing when he took her bet. Well, I'd have to say it's not looking too good from your side, Menendez said now, twitching her head at the red icons of the three Solarian destroyers on Boomslang's smallest master plot. Those three seem to be doing exactly what she, and the Commodore, let's not forget him, predicted. I know, Vizignos admitted finally, and I knew it'd probably work out exactly that way from the beginning, but the odds were so good. I only hope you're luckier in love than you are at cards and betting, Menendez told him. Oh, I am, I am, he assured her with a broad smile. Funny, she offered, still watching the quiescent destroyers. That's not what Sally Parkins down in engineering said. You don't want to believe everything you hear from snipes, Zignos warned her. Besides, I think she was uncomfortable in my presence because of my godlike good looks. He shook his head sadly. One of the crosses I bear, the women in my life realize they just can't compete with my superhuman physical beauty. Both women guffawed, and Lieutenant J.G. Josh Whitaker, Boomslang's communications officer, looked across the cramped command deck at him with round, admiring eyes. Is that what you call it, sir? He asked in awed tones. And here I thought your last name derived from the lordly dimensions of your proboscis. Pesignos lifted the proboscis in question, which was indeed of lordly dimensions, with an equally lordly sniff. Alas, it's ever my fate to be maligned by the little people, he said. But that's okay, I'm used to it. He heaved a deep sigh. I've been dealing with it since high school, after all. Yeah, sure, she said. Not the way I remember it, she added, and it was Pesignos' turn to chuckle. He and she had known each other since childhood, and she was probably his closest friend in the galaxy. That's because your mind is starting to go and- Hyper footprint, she snapped, cutting him off in mid-sentence. Somebody transmitting the terminus, ma'am. Acknowledged. Menendez's voice had turned crisp and coldly professional as quickly as Cheese had. She glanced at Whitaker. The comm officer had been waiting. Hot mic, ma'am, he confirmed, and Menendez's finger stabbed the transmit key on her command chair armrest before he finished speaking. Typhon, she announced over the suddenly live network of short-range whisker communications lasers in that same cold, hard voice. Typhon, Typhon. Then she released the key and looked around her command deck. Here we go, boys and girls, she said, make it count. As battle cries went, it lacked a little something in drama, she reflected, but that was all right. There'd be plenty of drama to go around without her adding to it. Hyper footprint. Commander Patricia Richtman, SLNS Voltiger's tactical officer, announced calmly. It wasn't as if the arrival was a surprise. They'd been expecting it for at least the last three hours, but they were waiting for battle cruisers after all. Every destroyer officer knew that the time required for any task expanded geometrically in proportion to the tonnage of the ship involved. 
be fair, Pat, she scolded herself. It wasn't just the standard transit prep this time. And unless you really want to walk home the long way, you should be happy they took the time to lay those pods. Because guess who'd be sent through to check for any manty visitors if Admiral Santini wasn't watching the back door? Got the transponder code? Captain Oglesby asked. Yes, sir, Richtman implied. It's Hindu. Firing now, Sarah Chi announced and pressed the key. HMS Echidna was a Hydra-class lac carrier. The Hydras were 33,000 tons smaller than the Minotaurs, which had preceded them, but they managed to pack in an additional dozen lac bays. All 111 of her serviceable lacs, one of the brood was downchecked by the group engineering officer, because its stealth systems had a stubbornly persistent glitch, had been launched and left behind, hiding in the midnight depths of the Ajay Terminus when Echidna and the rest of the Ajay picket took themselves elsewhere in obedience to HMS Sopo's relayed order from Commodore Lessum. They'd sat there waiting, watching the Solarian destroyers checking for defenders, and now it was their turn. It wasn't Patricia Richtman's fault no one had noticed them. She and her fellow tactical officers aboard Chamberlain and Timberlake, Voltiger's division mates, had searched diligently for any sign of warships. The problem was that no one in the Solarian League Navy who'd ever encountered the RMN's shrikes and katanas had gotten home to tell anyone else about it. As a consequence, no one in Task Force 1027 had ever imagined that something that small, a shrike massed only 21,000 tons and was barely 70 meters long, could possibly pose a threat to any genuine ship of war. Voltiger, at 112,500 tons, had no business in a fleet engagement, and her officers and crew knew it. The thought that anyone should worry about something less than a fifth their size would have been absurd. There was a reason, in fact, there were a lot of reasons, no serious Navy had built lacks for the past century or so. And even those which were in service were purely sublight system defense or patrol vessels. Without Warshawski sails and hypergenerators of their own, which no one could possibly fit into a hull that size, or the lack carriers no Solarian knew a thing about, they couldn't have been here in a J space anyway. And even if they'd known about sea lacks and the new generation lacks, Nothing else in the galaxy was as stealthy as a Shrike or Katana. Even active radar's effectiveness against them was hugely degraded at anything above very short range. The only way to really spot one of them, with its impellers down and its stealth systems up, was for it to occlude a star. And Commander Menendez, who was Echidna's Kolak, as well as Boomslang's CO, had made sure her deadly little ships were motionless relative to the Terminus. The chance that something their size and holding that still might occlude a star, or anything else for that matter, were slight. Had the Solarian destroyers looked hard enough and long enough, they might still have spotted them. Not even Manticoran EW could make them invisible to active radar with enough power behind it, but they were very close to invisible. Their radar return was far too tiny to represent any threat the SLN or its computers had ever heard of. People look for the threats they know about, and none of the men and women aboard those ships knew one damned thing about Shrikes. For example, none of them were aware that in addition to the Shrike B's internal rotary missile launcher, it carried a single spinal-mounted grazer as heavy as many a Super Dreadnought's broadside armament. I have the destroyer's impeller signature, sir, Captain Absalon Bajani's plotting officer announced as SLNS Hindustan reemerged into everyone else's universe. Very good. Bajrani acknowledged absently. His attention was on his helmswoman as the Nevada-class battlecruiser glided out of the terminus. Hindustan's sister ship, Osean, was on her heels, and Captain Hackenbrock had an acid personality backed up by a scalpel-sharp sarcasm. She was bound to say something rude if Hindustan was clumsy about getting out of her way. Not that Osean would be coming through that quickly. Admiral Isotalo had ordered a 25-second interval between transits. That was far longer than anyone would ever need. True, it would be another, he checked the display, 53 seconds before he could reconfigure from Warshawski sail to impellers, but those sails provided all the acceleration he'd need to keep Hindustan out of Osean's way. Not that Hackenbrock will see it that way. If not for the fact that she's just as competent as she is annoying, that mouth of hers would have... 24 grazers, each designed to rip straight through a super dreadnought's armor, slammed into SLNS Hindustan like the curse of God. It was like hitting a puppy with a ground lorry, only worse, far worse. 
not one shot missed. There were no sidewalls to stop the fire coming from Hindustan's flanks, and her side armor was woefully inadequate against grazer fire that heavy delivered from such brutally short range. Even worse, half the fire came in from above, where there wasn't any armor, because designers didn't armor areas of the hull normally protected by the wedge that ought to have been there. Jesus Christ, Patricia Richtman blurted, as 900,000 tons of battlecruiser and 2,300 men and women disappeared in the titanic fireball of failed fusion bottles. She stared at her plot in stark disbelief, then sucked in a shocked breath. Impeller signatures. Her professional voice was frayed and harrowed as the impeller wedges of Menendez's lacks sprang to malevolent life on her display. Many impeller signatures. Estimate 90 plus. Bearings. She broke off, slamming her heel on the button that locked her bridge chair shock frame. Missiles incoming, she said flatly. Estimate 75, no, 80 inbound. Time of flight, 20 seconds. A look in Menendez's eyes glittered with fierce satisfaction as the first Solly battlecruiser blew apart. Her shrike's heavy grazers could have blown through battlecruiser sidewalls at this range with contemptuous ease, but they didn't even have to do that. And while two of her squadrons dealt with Hindustan, three more of them launched against the Solarian destroyers who'd never seen them coming. The Shrike B carried 14 ship killers, and the attacking lax rotary launchers spat them out in a deadly stream. The range was so short they could easily have taken the Sollies down with grazer fire, but the Achilles heel of the Shrike's massive energy armament was that its fission reactor couldn't recharge its plasma capacitors in battle. The energy budget simply wasn't there. That meant her unit's energy fire was at least as limited as their magazine capacity, and she wanted all the grazer shots she could bank against future need. What the? Captain Chayula Hackenbrock blurted, snapping upright in her command chair as Osean emerged on the AJ side of the terminus. One moment the tactical display had shown only the calm, orderly line of battle cruisers queued up for transit. The next, it was littered with missile traces, impeller signatures, and the homing beacons of a bare handful of life pods speeding away from the fading fireball, which must be all that remained of Hindustan. Impeller signatures, many impeller signatures, her tack officer screamed. And then the Holocaust, which had hammered Hindustan, came for Osean as well. SLNS Ohio, Neptune, and Minotaur followed into the furnace one by one, emerging at neat 25-second intervals into the devastating fire of Lack Group 117, and the fire in Commander Menendez's eyes grew cold and bleak. They don't have a chance, not a chance. My God, it's not even shooting ducks, it's clubbing kittens. These poor bastards don't even know we're here until they sail right into our sights and we blow them to hell. Her jaw tightened and her nostrils flared. Whatever their high command and political masters might have done, surely the men and women aboard those dying ships were not so different from the men and women aboard her ships. Targeting change, she heard her voice say. Go for the hammerhead, Sarah. Take out the impeller rings, and the poor bastards are toast if they don't surrender as soon as we get back around to them. She grimaced. Let's not make any more orphans today than we have to. That was another entry in the complete audiobook serialization of Uncompromising Honor by David Weber. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to audible.com and to podcast theme composer, Ruth Judkowitz, and 15 buckets of bullets, confetti, and super glue, and instructions for assembling 14 super cool working sculptures of bullets and confetti in buckets. Plus, thanks, praise, and gratitude for Larry Correa, author of Destroyer of Worlds. Please join us next time here at the Hammering Heart of Science Fiction and Fantasy. Keep reaching for the stars.